Okay, so this session hopefully we'll catch up a bit with the lateness and we'll finish at the, at the allotted time. Um, but I will now pass over the control of the situation yeah. to Francis. Yeah. Can you hear the mic now? Kelly fixed me up yesterday. Is this, am I good? Yep, yep. Can you hear me? As good as it gets. It's not working. You, might have to you, you have no control over the levels. You just have to speak closer to the mic and make it louder. Speak like this. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, am I audible now? Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I had a conversation with people in the washroom, um, as women do, and we started to talk about uh, the level of energy and how tired everybody is. So uh, Chris and I have conferred, and what we'll try to do is to keep the presentations um, in this session uh, to a reasonably short uh, duration. There are two of them that we can easily do that with. It doesn't mean you you have you don't have to be shorter than this. Uh, Chris is going to summarize Andrew Hodgkin's presentation. Uh, my own can be quite short. The idea being that it would be very nice if we could start to have some kind of a synthetic dialogue towards the end of today. Uh, all of us have information overload. We've heard about I don't know 15 or 16 interesting projects. There are many convergences and interesting things about those projects that we haven't had a chance to uh, put together in a conversation. So I'll do my best to um, get us through the uh, presentations at the right pace so that there is a real opportunity for a conversation towards the end of this session. Um, the session is called uh, What Works? Uh, my responsibility with uh, RESDA has been for um, sustainable regions. Regions, the concept of region is, um, of course, something uh, is, is malleable. In our context here, when we're thinking about the North, most of us probably think of Indigenous territories as divine, defining regions. And very often, Indigenous territories and ecosystems or ecological, ecological zones are contiguous, think of river systems or coastal areas. Um, but you can, you also have to remember all the time, especially in a discussion about policy, that jurisdictions create regions. And so, and those don't map very well often on indigenous territories and on ecosystems, um, except where we have the modern treaties that have created institutions that are appropriate to the indigenous territories. So all that to say that the sessions in uh, this panel that you're about to hear are all pertinent to a reading of, um, to a regional analysis, but they could have been in any one of the other sessions. And that's just a feature of the way our project is designed. There are many intersect areas of analytical intersection and overlap. Uh, so it makes it a good session for us to think back over the whole day to try to bring forward some considerations. Uh, you know, what are the conclusions that we're, we're going to begin to draw from all of this research? The wording that what works um, comes from Natan Obed when he was, uh, before he was elevated to high office, when he was uh, working at Nunavut Dungavik Incorporated. He had a conversation with Chris um, about what might be a useful project for us to undertake at Resta early on in the course of our work and we were collecting ideas assiduously. Natan's idea was that uh, there's a lot of work about being done about what goes wrong, things that don't work, dysfunctions, various kinds of discrimination or things not working well. He said somebody should do some work finding out what does work. And he was particularly interested in uh, the concept of partnership. And there are two, in, I think, in two senses. First of all, in that simple sense, he wanted to know what makes a successful partnership between a community and a mining company. What are the ingredients of that when the partnership is working from the point of view of the community? The second part of it was, I think, um, he was questioning the concept of partnership because that term is used all the time now. Um, I think it goes back to uh, the neoliberal churn in Canada in the early 90s 
and in particular the response of the federal government to the final report of the royal commission on aboriginal peoples that report recommended a nation to nation reconceptualization of crown indigenous relations the government response which came the next year was a document called gathering strength talked about partnership on every page and they converted the concept of nation to nation mutuality to a concept of partnership and of course it's globally used now they're all kind of partnerships all over the place so I think Natan was interested in the practical dimension but he's but he also gave us an opportunity to ask the question what does this mean what are these what are the what are the senses in which partnership is used and are they always partnerships Josh Gladstone whom you just heard did a lot of the work on this project we're not finished we're part way through so I wanted to this the first project that we're talking about in this session I just wanted to tell you that that's the analytical basis of it and a little bit about our approach and how far we've gone and then I'll be done and it'll be Ben's turn so first we tried to do an inventory of all the different partnerships that exist in the four Inuit territories in Canada we found lots of them lots and lots of them formal relationships referred to as partnerships then we'd created a typology very simple typology there are project specific partnerships typically defined by IBAs or IIBAs but sometimes by other kinds of agreements between the community and a company there are sectoral partnerships typically that term is used for things like mining training or provincial or territorial mining strategies or regional monitoring ventures involving partnership finally there are federal or pan territorial large large-scale partnerships like the federal programs for human resource for training program subsidies for human resource development having that inventory we then began a literature review to look at how the term is used internationally and all and how it's working all the different assessments that are available about how it's working we had some early results of that that allowed us to start to try to model the connections among those scales and to think about what would make appropriate case studies in Inuit territories to try to understand how those interlocking partnerships were working out for in particular cases and that's the stage we're at we're searching for successful examples of partnership between communities and mining companies at any one of those scales or ideally situations where there were those connections are visible so that there's more than one kind of a partnership shaping the relationship and all of that is in aid of figuring out first of all what works what's the way to do this and what's the things not to do and secondly to understand whether we ought to shed that term partnership in some cases and apply a different label to the relationships that are emerging between industry and communities so that's that project you'll have to stay tuned for the results of it in the academic publication now it's my pleasure now to introduce Ben Bradshaw are you presenting alone or with someone but with Emily Barton with Emily Barton who is sitting beside him I got there too fast okay so I'll turn the floor over to Ben great thank you so much lovely to be here we are getting tired so feel free to heckle or comment as we go along we'll try to enliven this I certainly acknowledge support from ResDA through SHRC, MyTax, Polar Knowledge Canada and multiple partnerships thank you for making me aware of the historical origins of that with the Muscovy Nation, the Kawachikamak, the Nazi government, the Tucker River Tlingit First Nation recently with Emily and Jen Jones, the Little Santa Carmacks First Nation and the work that I'm presenting is of a nature where it's a more pan-Canadian I'm delighted to hear that when I first heard I was in a session on what works that puts a little bit of pressure but I think what Francis was referring to is what what works the question and I'm certainly happy to contribute to that and and certainly IBAs have probably been more mentioned in almost every presentation today and so there have been lots of contributors to that the question is how why do IBAs exist and how are they working we heard a remarkable case study 
uh, that in a sense explain the origins of the, uh, the first IBA at Raglan, given the awfulness of the Asbestos Hill mine. Uh, we heard about trusts and, and what forms of trust seem to work better. So I'm merely complementing what has already been done today by focusing on, on some issues. Um, let me just quickly, I know everyone knows what these are, but, but I do like to characterize IBAs in, in three ways. One is being super regulatory. They work alongside and as a complement to regulatory systems. That they are impact and benefit agreements serving two purposes. They first try to, to, to manage impacts. Uh, beyond what is required of EA, and they, they deliver benefits. And then they've been institutionalized, sometimes legally, because of jurisdictions where they are required because of modern land claims, and in other instances, informally, because that is simply what the expectation is. And we have tons of case evidence that when proponents try to get through regulatory procedures without an agreement in place, that they are held up. Uh, and, and I'm even going to re-emphasize the impact and benefit agreement label as opposed to some sort of compensation for impacts, an impact benefit agreement, uh, by use of this simple graphic which tries to make sense of, of the impact agreement part and the benefit agreement part. Way too simple, of course, uh, but if we think about some project that's being proposed relative to uh, prior conditions, the notion would be that without some of the mitigation offered through environmental assessment, community conditions would be far worse, environment would be far worse, that with mitigation within EA processes and apologies to those who are in the EA business, but you never get back to the status quo. And so the impact agreement gets you beyond what typically just EA does, at least from an indigenous perspective, though quite often doesn't get you back to the status quo. Uh, the benefit agreement portion is supposed to take you beyond. You're not, you're, you're supposed to benefit from development. And these are themes that People like Bob Gibson at Waterloo uh, are invoking when they talk about sustainability assessment or, or betterment. Uh, you know what's in them. Why don't we actually use the Nunatia uh, Valley IBA as an interesting example? Because it's one of, regarded as one of the better ones for a variety of reasons, probably most significantly because of the changes to project design that ultimately came out. And I think IBA is best uh, conceptualized as a means not just to to benefit, but to, but to change the project. And certainly the, the negotiations uh, made a change. Uh, most of you know the story. Teresa Howlett, the pictured on the left, has been the IBA implementation coordinator for the Nuts with for the last 12 years, seated with John Ward, the former spokesperson for Tiger River Clinkett. Um, the IBA is deemed exemplary because of its, its higher than 50% than, than, um, proportion of indigenous employment. The financial benefits that, like Raglan, included uh, profit sharing, which, which uh, was, was quite lucrative, the workplace conditions, environmental protection, independent monitoring, uh, and, and the emphasis on implementation. But probably most significantly because of this side separate shipping agreement that really serves as a bottleneck on production, limited to four shipments per winter using the same route. Um, if anyone wants to know the details, uh, I can certainly share these slides. Certainly there are some good examples of IBAs, IBAs out there, but there are also some problematic ones. And one interesting bit of debate in the literature that I want to draw your attention to just for two minutes is about, uh, about whether this is a, a sort of suitable band-aid, are we making progress, uh, or, or are these part of a larger colonial enterprise? And going back to one of the first uh, academic reviews of IBAs written by Karen O'Farkley uh, in, in 99, sort of baby steps talking about IBAs is helping to shift the balance of power towards those who are relatively weak. The processes that involve providing communities with information and the capacity to apply that information, and that can significantly enhance their relative power. Later in a 2010 paper, he also drew attention to the opportunity to create some distance, some autonomy from the state, uh, given, given the availability of, of funds. And, and that ultimately uh, adds to their own strength um, their ability to, to uh, self-govern, if you will. Um, I and others have also made the case that until something better comes along, IBA seem to be the clearest manifestation of the, uh, the achievement of free, prior, and informed consent. The Nazi would say that themselves. They talk about the IBA being their collective consent, the Boise's um, uh, Boreal Leadership Council, which is an interesting initiative of, of many sectors here in Canada, has produced a couple of interesting reports and are trying to exemplify ethic and practice to get away from some of the debates. And they quite often point to 
um, IBAs, and the, that work's been done by the Firelight Group. Um, but there's also a counter set of arguments that have really created an interesting dynamic, an interesting debate about the degree to which IBAs are facilitating ongoing colonial relationships, that these are band-aids, that that autonomy from the state is actually not what's expected. It's allowing the crown to get away from some of its obligations that it has through the treaties. And so there's a, a healthy dynamic at play. And, and so if we think about some of the key concerns that exist around IBAs, in addition to those identified this morning around, for example, trusts and, and these sort of things, um, I identified three that, that, I, that I've tackled through some research, including with graduate students like Emily Martin and Jennifer Jones. Uh, certainly that first one is, is a big one, and it's not something that we can probably tackle empirically. We, we, we rather are engaging in, in the debate and discussion. The two that I'll focus on for the next five minutes are around the uncertain position of IBAs and mine permitting, especially relative to processes like EA, and the execution of the Crown's consultation and accommodation obligations. And probably most problematically, in terms of those who know this well or are living in IBA uh, communities, communities, uh, communities that have signed IBAs and are being impacted by mining, there's this fear that community well-being is not advancing. Uh, certainly wealth, material wealth is improving, but that there's some problems here that we're not monitoring especially well and we're not practicing adaptive management. So let me present some results and recommendations um, over the next few minutes before I hand things over to Emily for a nice case study of what we're doing in UConn. Draw your attention to a simple observation that the permitting landscape in Canada has changed radically over the last 20 years. So that while EA might certainly draw a lot of attention and this year especially it is given the federal review um, it is just one of a few processes that ultimately a mine developer has to go through. Uh, and although consultation and accommodation has been shown by the courts to be something that can be achieved within EA, we also see examples where that's being done uh, in a separate table. So that too is, a, is a, uh, an important process that, 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 that developers are going through. Uh, IBAs, of course, and then also resource revenue sharing increasingly, not just in jurisdictions like BC, but also, of course, in some of the comprehensive land claim territories and even in, in the old treaty areas. And here I'm simply trying to differentiate between those processes in terms of some of the concerns that are addressed, the legal basis, which exists for some and, of course, doesn't exist for others, and then the sort of cultural basis in terms of why is it that these things are emerging, sometimes sort of around the, the principle of do no harm or a social license argument in the case of IBAs. Um, where there isn't a, a legal basis for it. And all this is to say that IBAs are just part of a, a big suite of permitting processes and that uh, from the Crown's perspective, uh, it makes sense to acknowledge and informally integrate IBAs within the permitting process. I remember when I first started doing research on IBAs about 13 years ago and I was calling up federal bureaucrats and talking about IBAs, they'd be, no, no. Don't, I have nothing to say. It's not our jurisdiction. Can't help you. And finally, by the third or fourth call, they say, well, we admit that our conduct influences IBAs and IBAs influence our conduct. And we're curious to know what's in them because, so there's, there has been an evolution, absolutely, where we're recognizing, especially around EA and IBA overlap, um, sometimes problematic, sometimes productive. So my suggestion here is that, uh, that, that integration is possible in at least in an informal way. And there's some nice models that exist that try to, to try to do that. Uh, especially around identifying impacts, which can become a, at least predicting potential impacts, which can be uh, a, a part of negotiations, certainly around monitoring and ongoing adaptive management. The other point I'd like to make is that it's evident that IBAs are seen as just one of many governance tools that can be used by Indigenous governments seeking to uh, exercise their authority around a potential mine development. Uh, and Tack River Clinkett, who I'm sorry, Chris, are just below 60, but accessed by Yukon, so it sort of fits within Resda, um, have done some remarkable work over the last 30 years around sort of their own, their own governance, their own self-governance. And undoubtedly, we, we see that those indigenous communities that do this kind of work are better positioned to participate in negotiations for an IBA or uh, EA, et cetera. And these are just some of the examples that the Clinket have been in involved in over the last while. Drawing on the case of the Nanatsu of it, um, really interesting, if you look at the Boise's Bay process, and Caitlin Kenny did this for her master's thesis, 
Oh boy, that didn't work out so well on your son's computer. That's my excuse. It looks good on, on mine. Uh, you don't need to know all of it except to know that, that, that the Labrador Inuit were engaged in land claim negotiations, IBA negotiations, protest, litigation, and though they claim that each step wasn't entirely strategic, in working with them to sort of make sense of it, they realized that there was a deliberate you know, action decision there that, that evolved. And so it, interesting to think about how these various governance tools fit together and, and work together from a community perspective. So the recommendation here directed more at the community side is to treat IBAs as one strategic element, not just for strategic reasons, but even in terms of community vision. So we know that, that in the case of the Decker or Clinkett, thinking about who they are, what their values are, what a mining policy might look like consistent with those values, and sending that message out to the world is a really thoughtful way to engage, and as John Ward points out, you know, when we have those things in place, we make decisions quickly. Um, being the point, echoing a point that was expressed by someone this morning about timelines and the inability of, uh, of some of the requirements of good governance to, to rest on one individual proponent's project. So this is, in a sense, a, a pan-Canadian exercise that needs to happen over a longer period of time. And finally, just draw attention to some interesting work uh, that we've been doing with a few uh, community partners who are interested in developing their own means of, of tracking community well-being, their own indicators, inserting that into the EA process, inserting that into long-term monitoring. Um, I can show you the results of, of one exercise with the Nascapi Nation of Kawachikamak, as they were happy to share that. Other communities, including uh, Brenda's work with Tutsil K, those appropriately have stayed private. But um, we had an interesting exercise with the Nascapi, who sought to develop indicators based on identifying their values, their, their interests, and worries around potential redevelopment of mining in the Shefferville area using those to create indicators and ultimately a household survey that was administered to about 95% of the households by a now an Arcan employee who is off uh, at a medical appointment this afternoon. But uh, the nice thing about the work is that instead of just presenting results in staid forms that formats that we like, high graphs, uh, the project had some money to hire a, a, a local artist who was able to characterize the results. In this case, the level of happiness, one of the indicators they chose uh, captured in, in the proportion with each uh, the individuals representing 10 households. And use of Nescapi, very proud that though they're the only speakers of it, that 90% of the households regularly use it. So the argument I'm expressing, or the recommendation that comes out of some of that work is that you know, given the lack of knowledge that communities have when they're presented with opportunities or um, proposals around mining, that uh, they're wise to develop their own set of well-being indicators and then absolutely insist that those things get pulled into EA and monitoring if, if they uh, want to know what's going to happen with respect to sort of the, not just the availability of, of, uh, of country food, but, but the, the, the uh, accessing of that country food, that should be built in. And these efforts are, are critical, I argue, and, and I've made that argument in a couple of papers, including with Jen Jones. Um, we were uh, gratefully invited by Little Seven Carvax First Nation to do some similar work, which is being sponsored, uh, feed money from RESDA, but more significant funds from Polar Knowledge Canada to enable uh, increased community participation in the exercise. And I'll turn things over to Emily Martin for the last two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> she had five minutes from the start. Five. <laughs> okay, difference here too. Hi, I'm Emily Martin, and I'm an MA student at the University of Guelph in geography with Ben Bradshaw. Um, and I had the opportunity this summer to work with Ben and more closely with Jen Jones in CarMax with the Little Salmon CarMax First Nation. So CarMax, for those who may not be familiar, is about two hours north of Whitehorse. Um, and with them, we were working on developing locally relevant indicators of health and well-being for use in the mining assessment. Um, so really briefly, I'll just talk about our methods of engagement. So they were mostly interviews, uh, individual interviews, as well as we did a community dinner data gathering event, which you can see evidence of there with the, the poster. Um, also important to note is that we had some community partners who helped us do interviewing. Um, one picture there who I conducted interviews with, and another gentleman who conducted interviews on his own. Health and well-being are very uh, personal and intimate topics, so I, I feel that it was really valuable that we had a few options uh, for people for who they could have those interviews with. Um, 
And then one, I think I can keep this in two minutes, one uh, theme that I noticed from my experience in CarMax um, was uh, duality. So a deep division within the individual. I think we all know that mining can be a deeply divisive issue within communities, but something that really emerged for me in my experience and conversations that I was able to have was uh, duality within the individual. So people who would speak um, one moment being incredibly concerned about contamination and wildlife and fish and how that negatively impacted their well-being. But in the next breath, um, expressing a desire for employment and expressing a desire for um, future mining in the area because that also uh, benefited their health and well-being. So it's a real split and it's a real tension uh, within the individual and that was a really, really important thing for me. And I think with that, I'll turn it back to Ben, or maybe pass it on to Jen, even. You just hit the next slide, and we'll say thank you. Okay. Um, but just noting that that duality presents a real challenge for negotiating, uh, not just IBAs, but any kind of negotiating in the community. So the challenge of not just developing consensus within the community and within a number of individuals, but within individuals themselves. Thanks. Thank you. Jen Jones, uh, who will continue this conversation. Um, thank you, Francis, um, and thanks, Ben and Emily, and Emily for setting up uh, some of my work. My name is Jen Jones. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Guelph. I'm working with Ben Bradshaw and uh, Sherry Lee Harper, who's in population medicine. Um, and the nice thing about going at the end of the day is that everyone else has contextualized my work. The sad thing about going at the end of the day is everyone's exhausted. So uh, if I speak way too fast, I'm going to look to Francis to slow me down. But if I'm speaking so you're falling asleep, I'll look to Chris. Um, <laughs> So uh, just by way of introducing myself, um, I live and work in Yukon. I've lived in Yukon for over 20 years of my life, adult life. I worked with the First Nations primarily in the area of community development and health and well-being. And my background is um, I have a master's of public health, and which looked at, uh, so I've worked in kind of uh, service delivery, not service delivery, but the policy and programming of service delivery. And the negotiations between our three levels of government um, federal, territorial, and self-governments, because we have 11 in Yukon, and negotiating some of the, the distinctions and the, and the implementation of policy. So what I'd like to speak to you today is, uh, I have no findings, and I have some thoughts, um, and I'm not going to give you very much context, because I want to get two things done today. I'd like to introduce you to some of the work that I'm doing, and I've called it, or with Chris's suggestion, which I think is a great suggestion, is reconsidering the integration of health and well-being into impact assessments and EAs. And because what I'm asking um, really uh, looks at how we look at health and well-being. So um, as Ben and Emily talked about, my work is in collaboration with the Little Sun Carmax First Nations. This is a First Nation that I've worked with uh, previously. It's primarily funded through Polar Knowledge Canada. Um, and it is assisting Ben, as you will see, uh, in his project. And I was funded through RESDA, and the second piece of my presentation was totally funded by RESDA. Um, and it builds, my work is building off an article here, but in, sorry, I'm going to keep my eye on time, which you can find in Northern Review. And so my PhD um, looks at, uh, I'd like to determine what legacies, and these are ongoing legacies, of colonialism that are persistent or reproduced within the governance of the extractive industry and how this is addressed in how we look at health and well-being. And so really simplistically, what does that mean? It means that I'm trying to understand how we look at uh, the links between colon legacies, ongoing legacies of colonization and health and well-being. And um, right now, so I work in two worlds, I feel like, because I'm working on the Polar Knowledge Project where we're looking at indicators and metrics, and I'm also kind of considering uh, from if, uh, right today, is um, what are novel frameworks? And, and how do we answer this question that we're hearing more in our communities, which is uh, settler colonialism and colonization, which 
four years ago or five years ago would have not been a word that I would have heard. And I worked in health and social and had you know, fairly day-to-day -day run ins with our First Nation leaders or at least our department heads. And it wasn't discourse, it wasn't language. And now we're hearing our leaders. I just sat with one the other day talking about settler colonialism and colonization. So I think the discourse has changed. And what is coming up of, uh, out of that and what does it mean for EAs and IBAs, particularly when we start looking at health and well-being? Um, thanks to Kent who kind of set us up kind of historically in the normative frameworks of health and well-being and how those have been determined and the kind of constructs that inform how we today look at health and well-being. Um, and you can read as much as I can, but I think key to what people have been saying as we look at land, we look at this relational approach that our First Nation counter, uh, partners talk about when they speak about this concept of health and well-being. Um, and that really, when we're looking at this uh, concept of health and well-being, however it's defined, um, and I'm sorry I don't know your name from FemNet North, uh, Jane at, kind of talked about colonization, and it, so our, when we're looking at the health and well-being of citizens, at least in Yukon, and I would argue across the country, and I think everyone would agree, that we can't uh, disregard that it is happening within this le ongoing legacy of colonization. And also a current discourse, uh, much more prevalent around uh, not just reconciliation, but resurgence, and what does that mean? So that's the context. So methodology, as Emily said, this kind of draws on, um, I, I think I'll just step back. My work uh, as I move forward really is asking what it means to, or what it means to consider to decolonize method, uh, research. And, um, and not, I think, a pat answer, as uh, many of us would agree, agree, and that this is really a process. Um, it's involving interviews with uh, Little Salmon Carmack's uh, First Nation members. I'm interviewed talking with people in our assessment process and our other government uh, governance processes, uh, government workers, and other First Nation um, uh, workers who are working in health heritage. Uh, and the assessment process, and speaking to some of our uh, leaders today and uh, at the past, I mean, they're not passed away, meaning that they're retired from their work. Um, and that um, we've done, with Emily's great help this summer, we did around 40 interviews, um, and there's more to come. There's an advisory committee up uh, in CarMax, and that's who I'm reporting to primarily. And um, this summer we were met, we, it's mostly qualitative, it is all qualitative, but we did do a flash survey, for lack of a better word, where we had heard through our community meeting uh, a value and we just wanted to get some kind of uh, strength to that value. So we asked people four questions just around that value, which was community gathering. So, wow, I can talk fast. Uh, so where am I? Initial considerations. So really I think what I'd like to leave with this little piece of it is how health is being described. So what we hear is what is health and when, depending on who's speaking to that question you get very different things. But the thing I think we're hearing at is, or at least I'm hearing, and it'd be interesting to reflect again with uh, Emily, is that these, line, these two terms, these two concepts really mean different things and also have no relevance and no resonance for some community members. And I think we've heard that before. We struggle with that in health policy. When we're working for the First Nations, we want to talk about well-being. And that's not necessarily unanimously adopted or uh, agreed upon. So it really does uh, consider what we mean when we go to communities and we start going, so what does health and well-being mean to you? And, and, and what kind of dynamics do we get out of that? Um, I think the change in discourse is really important, and it will be interesting to see how this kind of flows through my conversation. I think when I met Ben, I had one kind of discourse going through my head, and that came from where I was positioned, and all of a sudden coming back, I'm like, whoa, and that discourse comes, I would say, yes, out of the TRC, but I also think it's a mounting frustration um, amongst some of our citizens uh, and mm, leaders um, around how we look at health and well-being in these mechanisms and how we're defining health and well-being. Uh, the other thing I kind of wanted just to draw two little things, uh, your attention to two little, two things. 
um, absent data as data. And so what we're not hearing, and that was really evident this morning, uh, this summer when Emily and I were interviewing citizens, and what was not being told to us, and Emily spoke uh, a little bit about, or just made reference to the very fact that community members weren't going to share with me, um, or Emily, uh, because they don't wish to be pathologized as ill, or as violent, or dealing with drug and alcohol abuses. Uh, and so what is shared when we go into the communities or when con uh, contractors go into the community or even then brought to the conversations around EAs and IBUs? And there's several reasons for that. And I'm happy to discuss those. I, I, I understand that there's several reasons. The other piece that I'm very interested in as someone who works in public health is this whole notion of population health and the social determinants. So I'm going to kind of leave it there about this idea of fitting into categories and hopefully people will go, ah, oh, what's she talking about? Or, oh, I disagree. And if you disagree, please come talk to me because I would love to have that conversation with you. But the gist of it is, is that we are asking, uh, we have been asking our First Nation partners to kind of fit their concepts of health and well-being into very normative frameworks. And then at the end of the day, we hear after the um, water board hearing or after the uh, decision has been signed that no, you didn't hear us. And I think we're seeing evidence of that uh, right now. Okay, great. Oh, so that's it. <laughs> One more minute. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that uh, we offered a course uh, about this whole idea of uh, continuing sustainability in the community. This was funded by Chris. This is a separate kind of project kind of built into what I'm doing. Um, and the course is called uh, is a research assistant training is to uh, work with um, citizens of uh, uh, Little Simon Carmax First Nation and Nacho Nayak Dan. It was offered at the Carmax Community Con Campus. And we looked at these five things. I'd like to draw your attention to personal safety. And the reason, because uh, we all go into communities and oftentimes we're hiring people. And uh, we talked about in this course around what it means to be a researcher and what your rights are. And it's a really, I would, I would urge us all to consider what it means to empower people that we hire uh, to be able to say no or what are your, your rights. And um, if I can have two, a few more seconds. Uh, and, and the reason that I suggest that is because we're asking people to interview their community members um, and we make huge assumptions with that. And maybe you don't, but I think some people that I've talked to have made some huge assumptions about that, about people, well, they know their community members, they're going to be okay. But when we send community members out to do work, with us, oftentimes they don't understand what we're talking about in terms of ethics, but, so we were talking about ethics, but they don't understand, or they don't uh, have agency, not that they don't understand, if they don't have agency to say, ah, oh, actually I don't want to go and interview those people. And so it's really empowering people, and I think that's part of this work, is to empower people when they're working for people like myself, or anyone in this room, or contractors, uh, what they can uh, ask for from those contractors. So this is a um, part, this was the curriculum, curricula, was developed for a curriculum, no, a curriculum <laughs> developed for a curricula uh, that we're going to develop, um, uh, it's a four course certificate offered through community campuses, um, and thanks to Chris, so we've got one down, we have three more to go in two years. So, uh, and basically, we're work I'm working with the Northern Tachoni Council to develop that, which is uh, in Yukon one of the language groups. So that's done. Thank you very much. Well done. I, I would like to, I'm sorry. I would like to thank everyone. Uh, this is funded by Polar Knowledge Canada, Little Sound and Carmax, uh, Resda University of Guelph, and the So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was very good. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce. Chris Southcott, who is Andrew Hodgkins. Yes. Um, first of all, a little bit correction. You weren't funded by me. You were funded by Resda, who <laughs> thought Sorry. that was a great idea. And so Resda thought that the work you're doing needed the support. Um, OK. Um, so uh, we have a project. Andrew Hodgkins is leading a project. We have looking at employment and training and uh, the impact on education. Um, he couldn't be here, so I'm briefly going to, uh, to talk about his project. I can't talk about it in any great detail because he knows it much better than I. He did do a presentation on this particular project at the International Rural Sociological Association meetings in Toronto, and it's based on that presentation that, that, that I'm, I'll talk today. 
Um, this is a project that he's doing in partnership with the town of Pond Inlet in North Baffin, and it, it's looking, first off, um, the first stage of it is to looking at uh, the employment and training situation uh, for the North Baffin communities uh, involved in the Mary River project. Um, so he has looked at um, the employment uh, situation there. Um, he has analyzed the data that's available from employment in uh, the Mary River project from the North Baffin communities. And he spent um, last summer uh, interviewing um, people um, uh, from the North Baffin communities employed uh, or no longer employed uh, at the Mary River uh, project. And so, uh, as I say, he, his project has, come, has produced quite a, little, uh, uh, quite a lot of data which I can't um, uh, talk about, but we will put his PowerPoint from the International Rural Sociological Association meetings up on the, our website later on. But just to talk ab ab about his initial findings, and he wants to sort of take this example and then, and then compare it to uh, 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 an example that we've talked about several times here today, which is the Boise Bay um, example, um, and to compare the situation in Labrador and the Nuvatsiavu region with the situation in the Mary River region. So one of the, the broad ideas that he's talking about is he notes that the employees, the people living in the North Baffin communities, generally have positive attitudes towards the employment at, at Mary River. Um, they, they, they find that for employment in Mary River, there's a lack of adequate support for them, um, similar to, I think, the findings that Gertie talked about. There's lack of adequate support. <coughs> There's quite a bit of job insecurity. They don't have um, a lot of information about when jobs become available and um, there's, they're not certain that they're gonna have the job for a long period of time because there's a lot of, 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 of layoffs that happen. And so there, there is, there's not a feeling that the jobs are gonna last a long time. And as I already mentioned, there's poor communication about these employment opportunities. But uh, wider, um, Wider questions are uh, related to the IBA that was signed between QIA and Mary River. Um, is you know the, if the provisions, employment provisions, are realistic. That often we see that in um, the uh, IBAs that are negotiated, the the uh, the objectives are rarely met in terms of employment objectives. And so, are these realistic? Is a question one can ask. And then finally, a question is the role of the state, um, when, especially when um, the provisions in the IBA aren't lived, into, lived up to, the role of the state uh, in, in supervising and sort of enhancing or enforcing um, provisions uh, related to employment in IBAs. Um, and then another question that is the role of unions uh, in the IBA process, employment in, in, through the IBA process. And so that's all I'll say about his project. And as I say, um, he regrets not being here. He, his um, his uh, results will, PowerPoint with some of his results will be put online later on this one. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Andrew Muir, who is uh, one of my own doctoral students, nearly finished his dissertation. Um, his work is based in Rankin Inlet. Thank you very much. So, Andrew, 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Just one second here. It should be a little bit tall. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so today I'm just going to be doing a very brief uh, presentation, uh, which will be based on the research I've performed uh, for my dissertation in public policy at, at Carleton under uh, supervision of the branch table. I hope to defend my thesis um, this year or early next year. Um, so the main uh, research aim which I had is to understand kind of the institutional structure of the community of Rankin Inlet in Nunavut. Rankin Inlet is, as most of you know, I'm sure it's about 2,500 people. 
Uh, I chose it as a case study because it was founded um, in 1953 when many uh, Canadians and uh, Inuit people went to work there uh, in a nickel mine, and it's the only community in Nunavut that was founded around an industrial development. Other ones were formed around a missionary uh, presence, RCMP or Fur Trade Post. Uh, so, in terms of the research I've done so far, I've uh, reviewed literature on the Canadian state's historical involvement in the Arctic. Uh, I've looked at the institutional basis of Inuit society and their economy, uh, particularly Inuit in the Kivalik region of Nunavut, um, who ended up being many of the first miners in the 50s. And they were historically, or many of them were historically referred to, they were so named as uh, by anthropologists as caribou Inuit. Uh, in addition, I went to Rankin and I stayed there for about a month in 2012 and I tried to do interviews with the informants, including elders, business people, government officials, and uh, local community members. Oh, in addition, I, um, I went to the University of Saskatchewan um, where Professor Robert Williamson, who uh, is now deceased, uh, he had left his a lot of his life's work in the archives there. Um, he actually lived in Rankin Inlet for several years uh, while the mine was open and afterwards, and he went on to become a professor at University of Saskatchewan. And uh, he wrote quite a bit about uh, Inuit culture and intera Inuit interaction with uh, commercial activity, including at the mine itself in the 50s and 60s. Um, so just some pretty modest goals here. I've just explained the analytical and theoretical approach to my thesis, present some preliminary interpretations of the work I've done so far. Um, just talk a little bit about maybe where this could lead for future research, and then be happy to answer questions and receive any feedback that anyone has. So, uh, I I'm starting really from scratch in terms of my theoretical assumptions because um, I find it interesting. So um, my thesis begins, uh, it rests on Marshall Sollins, who was a kind of a renowned anthropologist who developed something called a continuum of reciprocity, which states that all human activity ranges from that in which social considerations are paramount and material considerations like becoming wealthy are less important. Uh, to that in which social considerations are absent and material gain is the primary goal. So in pre-European Inuit, Inuit economic activity, social considerations were an extremely important factor. Material gain was secondary or non-existent. And the majority of economic activity in uh, Inuit society was governed by the extended family and other societal institutions. Commercial activity, so the mine would be an example of commercial activity, is performed for material gain, um, not to enhance personal relationships, and as we all know, it usually requires a state to enforce contracts and ensure uh, security of property and persons. Um, in the Great Transformation, Carl Polanyi, who I, whose work I uh, find very interesting, um, and he was looking at the expansion of markets throughout 19th century Britain and Europe, argues that the imposition of commercial activity in a non-commercial context can cause harm and undermine the institutions which support community well-being. However, effective populations may resist uh, in different ways in order to protect themselves. Um, so in terms of using that analytical framework to understand uh, rank in Inlet's institutional uh, framework and institutional framework of the economy. I, I went throughout kind of the history of commercial activity in the Kivalik okay. region. Um, and what you see is that uh, the Inuit of that region strategically participated in emerging uh, commercial opportunities, which basically came in three waves or three distinct periods. So there was the Ford Prince of Wales period when uh, it was essentially a fur trade post in Churchill, Manitoba, present-day Churchill, Manitoba. Um, then there was the whaling period, I think a lot of people know, and that was very interesting. There was Inuit uh, 
they did whaling themselves, they traded with whalers, they lived on whaling ships, and then finally uh, was the fur trade era, era, and that was before Rankin Inlet was founded. Um, so as, as I mentioned, Inuit, in my view, strategically participated in all of these economic activities. And the key point coming out of this is that there's some disagreement in the literature, but essentially existing Inuit institutions and activity and existing economic activity, so hunting in, in particular, they remain most important. Commercial activity tended to remain on the periphery of the Inuit uh, society. Um, then in the 50s, um, many Inuit moved to work at the mine in Rankin Inlet, as I mentioned, and I, that's when what's called the mixed economy uh, emerged in Rankin Inlet. And it, my view it represents the latest phase of strategic participation and available economic opportunities. So that includes com uh, commercial, traditional, and other. And the mixed economy obviously has been widely discussed here. And whereas um, the existing institutions, so the family and other societal institutions maybe don't play the same role they once did, there's a new balance, uh, a new balance of institutions. Um, and as has been discussed, still interestingly, the mis mixed economy now is in sustained in part by uh, more higher level governmental institutions, which are the result of successful Inuit efforts to represent their interests at the federal level. These institutions provide the Inuit of rank and throughout Inuit with mechanisms to resist and regulate and potentially benefit from uh, commercial forces. So when Polanyi is talking about uh, 19th century Britain and Europe, uh, he says society resisted in something called a counter movement. Um, and this took the form of labor laws and the development of the welfare state, which essentially protected uh, the people there from the, uh, the penetration of co commercial forces throughout society. In my view, uh, the Inuit, the Kavalik region, had something similar analogous to a counter movement in how they uh, strategically relate, regulated their um, interaction with commercial activity to, to protect their, themselves and their well-being while taking advantage of existing opportunities. So there was kind of an on the ground counter movement. And then in the, in the latter half of the 20th century, there was a, a legislative counter movement where the Inuit across Nunavut took advantage of opportunities at the political level to represent their interests. So I just, I mean, I know for many people that are already very immersed in these questions, but these are just questions that are emerging in my head as I'm completing my research. But um, So within rank and inlet or across the good, what is the relative balance of commercial versus traditional versus other forms of economic? economic activity. Uh, one thing I learned while I was there is that many people in Rankin Inlet consider it to be an industrial, uh, there, there's an industrial spirit which um, people are proud of the mine that was there in the 50s and the early 60s. And probably Rankin um, has a greater proportion of commercial activity versus many other uh, communities in Nunavut. However, that I think that's worth exploring. Um, how do existing governments, so government of Nunavut and Canada programs affect individual and family decisions regarding time allocation and various forms of activity, economic activity, and I was just thinking, so Josh was talking about the Nunavut Hunter Support Program, so how is something like if there was a guaranteed annual income instituted, which I know is, is starting to be discussed, how would this affect decisions that people make on how they, what kind of economic activity they do. Are they more likely to hunt, less likely to hunt? I think that's worth exploring. And what are the challenges, so what are the constraints facing territorial and local, and local decision makers in, uh, in maintaining the balance of commercial versus traditional versus other forms of economic activity? Um, so, that's it, thank you very much. very much.
we have a few minutes for discussion. Uh, I'd like to invite you uh, to ask ask questions of the panelists or comment on the presentations. Can you remember back to the first one? <laughs> that was yours. Oh, that's right. <laughs> But maybe stand and introduce sure. yourself to it. I was uh, having trouble hearing everybody. Sure. Uh, my name is Stefan. I work for Stratos uh, Consulting Firm. So I'm not a social scientist by training, nor am I an academic. So I'm going to ask a question that maybe other people know more about, but I'm just interested uh, in your comment around decolonizing research and what that, what that Maybe you can illustrate that. <coughs> or or if, maybe that's the ultimate challenge. I think that's the ultimate question. Yeah. Yeah. Can the people at the back hear this at all? No, okay. Would you repeat your question? I'll say it again. Or actually, you could come to the mic and it, repeat it. I'll say it. Okay. Uh, I just want to, to comment on decolonizing research and if there is emerging practice. What is the emerging practice for decolonizing research? Uh, or is there one? Um, thank you. I think it's a really good question, and I think that's part of the work that we're seeing a lot of scholars look at um, in terms of using, uh, we, we often talk about community-based or participatory, it's one form of engaging the communities and actually the decision-making process. Um, I would argue uh, it goes a lot further than that because I think it is actually a process, and I think it's uh, some people spoke to about their uh, relationship um, between uh, our First Nation partners and research. And uh, I guess I'm reflecting on kind of a conversation I just had the other day with um, a, a, a leader in our communities about uh, he too is struggling. What does it mean to decolonize research? Um, and where I'm standing today, um, for me personally, it's about and I think someone else questioned, so it's not my question, someone else asked this in the room and uh, other people have asked this, is why do we continuously do the same things if it's not working? So how do we kind of deconstruct that um, that question and then put it into the work that we're doing? So if something's not working, how do we move forward? So sorry that's really vague, but I think that's part of the process. Would anyone else like to answer the question? Yeah. No? Uh, do you have another quite a different question? I would just say that increasingly um, this debate is going on in the universities. My own institution has a two-year, a two-week uh, summer institute on that on that matter. It draws people from all over. Uh, many universities now have um, been tackling that question. There's also quite a fine body of scholarship now. You can read about it. A very accessible book is by Sean uh, Wilson called uh, "Research as Ceremony." Is that Wilson. Yeah, it's not well, sound like what I said. Is there one A concrete example that might be useful? Um, a concrete example, but do you want me to offer one? Oh, yeah, do you want me to offer one? Okay. Well, um, that concept of partnership is one of the, the concept of management is another. We have to question ourselves for using those concepts as we work with Indigenous communities. My principles are try to do work that people ask me to do, not that I think of. Um, almost all the time, uh, and I try to um, listen before I formulate a question. Uh, those are things that help erode the um, uh, the power that people who are going to actually do the research have, the power of the pen and of interpretation. So it's a process of uh, coming to a certain let's base of humility and listening and understanding that we're all on a learning path, not there was something to offer. That, those are the roots of it, but everybody's working out their own way of operating, and all of us are learning it as we go. Uh, but it's important to remember that unless we're working in an indigenous language, um, we're using concepts that don't fit very well with people's <coughs> experience. I thought Jen's comments were very uh, powerful in that regard, and it's true in my own field too, which is to do with employment training and economy. So that means we have to be very careful um, how we conceptualize what we're doing and very careful to follow the lead of the people we're trying to work with. That would be me. Anybody else want to comment on this? No. I just had another question. 
Okay, different question. All right, we'll go with different. Qu are you on this point? Well, I was just going to give another example. With okay. Kevin Ornette, we started with the notion of economic restructuring and how did it affect women. And one of our DNA participants said, well, it's going to take me a long time to figure out how to talk about that in our community. We don't have words. But our concepts are not the same as those, right? So it wasn't just how do you translate it to clear language. It's like totally different. Like those concepts did not exist in her language. Thank you. Um, question at the back, or comment or question? Yeah, it was just a comment. I'll get on to the later one here. Um, so we talked about the role of, um, potentially the role of the state in um, enforcing impact benefit agreements. Um, I heard that mentioned in one of the presentations. And I just wanted to uh, raise to the group kind of the question of the role of the state um, in impact benefit agreements. And uh, we talked a lot about company Yeah, thank you. And uh, I was thinking too of the regional organizations, or regional Inuit organizations. Yeah. Uh, there, it is a three-cornered relationship. Do you want to comment then, or should I just keep going? You can if you like. No, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the next question. No, no, this is your topic. I was just going to say, uh, so I guess I wasn't convincing with my label impact and benefit agreements, but okay. Um, I mean, the state is a really interesting question and the state's been trying to grapple with what would be, at least the, the Canadian crown, what would be the way that, that the state could be useful. I mean, so much of it has been manifest in, in toolkits for communities around understanding mind cycles and various impacts and, and these sort of things. Uh, but I, certainly around consultation and accommodation, that's such a concrete area where there's obvious overlap. And Avalon Minerals uh, signed an accommodation agreement. That was the name they came up with for an IBA. So that's one of the obvious areas. We know that the state, the Crown, is delegating authority to companies to fulfill consultation and accommodation. So that's one of the areas where I think we have to, to formalize. And, and if that is going to be the fulfillment of that, then all the parties have to understand that and agree to that. Uh, so that's just one example of where, where there could be some more formalization. I do not see a role for the state ensuring fulfillment of IBA obligations. Just take them to court if that's the ultimate. The dispute mechanism hasn't worked, then it's a contract, like any other contract. Take them to court. Thank you. Um, Stefan? Yeah, on that question, I thought that was an interesting discussion, uh, the augmentation of the IBAs versus the state enforcement that Chris brought up. True answer. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 but uh, what I wanted to know is, like, I, uh, having worked with some IBAs, uh, I, I found there's a lot of loose targets in there. And uh, what happens if they are not being reached? Uh, uh, it's not really brought up. Like the Mary River is a good example where you have higher, uh, you know, uh, goals, and you can't meet, meet the same uh, rank and to some extent. So what, uh, what, what I like to see more in these IBAs is like the what if scenario. What if we don't need it? What is this next step? How can the company help? How can the state help? And I disagree a bit with Ben because where you see real advanced advances, uh, where a government really gets involved, I think that's it. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Indigenous government. Yeah, I yes. Does Makovic have a comment on state. hitting targets? John Mark or uh, Charles? No, for targets? Can you repeat, sorry? <laughs> does does Makovic um, have a comment on meeting, meeting the targets that are have a role to play in enforcing IBAs or I IBAs um, for employment, for example? Yeah, it's funny because uh, I'm right in the middle of discussion because uh, Dragon will uh, extend their operation, and we have to see into the new annex and the employment rate.